Hello, I'm Will Yeoman, and this is another edition of Pod Street, a very special edition today because we're recording from the beautiful Tom Collins house in Swanbourne. And today it's also special because I'm joined by Ian Reid. Ian, welcome to Pod Street. Thank you, Will. Now, you're primarily known for your historical novels and so forth, and um, in fact, you're a very prolific blogger too, which is important to note. But your first love it was poetry, is Indeed. poetry. And That's right. And your collection, which we're talking about today, Breaking the Surface, sees you return to that first love. It does. Why now? Partly because I felt that uh, after five novels in a fairly short space of time, I'd probably said for the moment what I wanted to say in the form of historical fiction. And partly because my interest in storytelling, which is always there in some way or other, seemed to need for a while to have a more concentrated form. And, And... Poems, of course, do more than just tell stories. In fact, some of them don't tell stories at all. They can be more imagistic and uh, a little vignette that may not have a narrative dimension. But one of the things I wanted to do was to see what it was possible to say with a dimension of narrative at times, with a focus on the particulars of observed uh, phenomena, and in particular to develop my sense of rhythm, because one of the things that has seemed to me to be lacking in a lot of contemporary poetry is uh, an understanding of the ways in which poetry, if it wants to be memorable speech, as uh, it's classically been defined, uh, needs to uh, look not only at the visual qualities of language, at its capacity to develop images and... uh, patterns of observation, but to develop also patterns of sound, which doesn't need to be in a symmetrically regular form, although I have rather unfashionably uh, included in this book uh, some a couple of sonnets, not that they would necessarily be recognised as such, they're a little informal, uh, some uh, other traditional forms such, such as Terzarima, But I do so not as a kind of um, obsessive formalist, but because I want to explore various ways in which patterns of sound, as well as patterns of imagery, can constitute memorable speech. Mm, Actually, I wanted to pick you up on that point, because um, there are two ways of coming to this, aren't there? There's the, um, what they call the hieristic, where you decide on a form first, and then that sort of aids you in coming to an idea or a thought or something. And there's the other way, which you have... You want to say something and you're looking for the form that will best suit that and represent that subject matter. So I'm not sure whether you do either or both or how you would consider that. It's it's the latter for me. In in fact, some of the poems in here, including some with a highly formal, uh, regular structure, Mm. began quite differently as as little uh, pieces of prose. To give you a very quick example, I was some years ago, asked to write something in prose, no more than 100 words, as one of several people who were approached for that by a Fremantle artist, Mary Moore, who had a commission to produce some artwork for the Joondalup Aquatic Centre. And she wanted little pieces, prose pieces, that reflected on experience with water. And I wrote something there, which was used for that purpose. It's up there in a on a tile on the wall, Um, but I continued to... I I found that the the images continued uh, in my mind to to revolve and they started to take on a particular rhythmic form. And that rhythmic form um, uh, became quite formalised. And so there are a couple of poems here that that came out of that. So that would be typical of the way I work. There's an image, there's a, a subject matter... And it gradually, in my mind, starts to form a a pattern or two. And if it seems to be leading to a a relatively symmetrical structure, so be it. Mm. If it's a free of verse form, I'm comfortable with that too. And I think poetry should be able to accommodate various degrees of formality and flexibility and not uh, think that somehow there's something shamefully ancient about the practice of write, <laughs> writing not in writing in verse or yeah, yeah. Um, I mean you're interested you, you, I'm interested in the idea that you 
essentially had a prose draft and there is that school where a lot of poets will do a prose draft first yes. and then gradually look for the form that suits that subject matter. Yeah. Is that something that you would often that, do or in this case it was just an exception? From time to time. I mean, one of the pieces in here, another piece, uh, began was first published in a, a flash fiction uh, okay. magazine and uh, it was quite good in that form, I, I think. I always uh, see that stuff as prose poetry, actually. Quite well, often well, exactly. it feels like that. Exactly, you know? exactly. But as I thought about it, I saw some advantages in giving it uh, line breaks um, to bring out certain of the rhythms mm. and, and bring mm. in some little surprises. Because one of the things that I, I guess is should be absolutely obvious and axiomatic about uh, poetry, except what we like to call uh, prose poetry, um, is that it utilises line breaks in order to direct the reader's attention and to govern the pace of reading. Mm. And that may seem super obvious, but I must say that in a lot of the contemporary poetry that I read, there seems to be little regard, uh, too little for my liking anyway, uh, regard for the capacity of lineated verse to um, regulate the flow, to emphasise uh, certain nuances, uh, to give a particular direction and pace and tempo. So, so in that regard, do you see it as a special form of punctuation? Yes, I think mm. in a sense that's, that's exactly what it is. I mean, the, the thing about traditional verse forms, I, uh, by which I include free verse, is that... Um, um, they are a way of slowing the reader down. I mean, we, for obvious reasons, we nearly all read too hastily most of the time. And what poetry can offer, which the historical novel can't in quite the same way, is uh, the regulation of that pace. Mm. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's not only line breaks, it's also stanza breaks in, in poetries that include that, whether regular stanza forms or not. Um, and of course, in, in continuous prose, you can do that with paragraph breaks as well, but it's not quite the same. And to isolate a phrase or to have a word teetering at the brink of a line before the eye slides around to the next line, these are little subtle ways in which poetry can, I think, uh, lend itself to memorable um, speech. It can be a way in which, if it's well done, uh, it lingers in the mind. Absolutely. I think you're referring to forms of enjambment there as well, whereby yeah. that lineation gives you that opportunity to use that tool in a way that continuous lines don't, because you can break up meanings Indeed. into different lines, and it adds a sort of tension, doesn't it, and a stress, which doesn't yeah. resolve until the following line. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what I'm often trying to do in these mm. poems. So, well, okay, so talking about these poems, we have, we've talked a lot about the forms, we haven't talked about the subject matter and the themes and so forth. Yeah. So, again, there's a variety of, of subjects and forms in, sorry, and themes in here, mm. but as you pointed out before we started this conversation, there are also some particular areas that are of most interest to you. There, are, there is a pattern that emerges throughout the collection. Could you tell us a bit more about those very special sort of themes. First of all, uh, the book itself is divided into several sections, okay. several named sections, which signpost certain thematic clusters or poems that in one way or another seemed to lend themselves to being grouped mm. together. Mm. Uh, and there's nothing programmatic about that, but uh, nevertheless, I think uh, any careful reader will see why things have been grouped as they are. For example... There is one section which is based um, mainly on works of visual art, uh, paintings, or in a few cases, uh, photographs or other things. And uh, I'm not trying there to describe in, in any simple direct sense what's in the painting. The painting is its own language, but it's a way of beginning to meditate on something that the paintings or whatever they are have suggested. So there's a section there. There's another section uh, on my long dead parents and some of the other family things that that has brought to mind um, and, and so forth. There's a section on non-human creatures. Mm -hmm. The final section is called Other Bodies. And uh, so... In various ways, there are subsections, there are groupings, uh, thematic or uh, associated in some way. 
However, whatever the form and wherever within a particular section a poem is located, I'm always trying to do the sort of thing I was touching on a moment ago. I'm trying to find ways in which particular rhythms and clusters of image will create a statement that is not just about me. Uh, one of the things I find tiresome in some poetry is that it's all about me, me, me. And in fact, there is a poem here which, which includes the line, me, 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 <laughs> um, and tries to distance the poem from that. So I'm trying, as, as, someone, as a reviewer of one of my early books said, to look at the not me with love and interest and try to say something valid. That was a comment by the late Judith Wright, which I greatly value because mm. it seemed to go to the heart of what mm. I hope is distinctive about uh, the best of my, my poems. Um, of course, they're also personal. Every poem must be in some sense. Mm. They have one's own thumbprint there. But whatever the subject matter, um, I'm trying always uh, to put the focus on something other than my inner self mm. or my mm. feelings of the moment. And I'm guessing the idea of the, you know, other bodies or a description of a visual work or even talking about your parents, it's by default, it takes you away from the eye, from, yeah, the, from yeah. the focus on the eye, even though it's you that's exactly the witness. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that's quite useful in that regard, presumably. That's true. Mm. Um, someone commented at uh, the recent book launch that um, quite a few of my poems use the second person, you, in a way which, of course, is partly addressed to the potential reader of the poem, but is also using you in the, in the general sense yes, in which one, yes. one, one does. Um, so uh, that's, that's one way of, of getting away from the from the obsession that so much contemporary poetry I mean, that, seems to show. That's what really interests me because um, I was just thinking about my editor at, at the West, uh, the travel writer Stephen Scarfield. He has this almost dogmatic insistence that all travel writing has to be A, in the first person, mm -hmm. and B, in the present tense. Mm -hmm. And I've always rebelled against that because I found that just so overwhelmingly tiresome as well. Yes. I did this, then I did that, then I did this. Yes. And I'm thinking yes. you've really got to try and figure out a different way to write about well, your own experiences. Yes. Well, quite. I mean, who cares what Ian Reid is doing at this moment <laughs> or thinking or feeling unless there is something that extends from the writer into, uh, the, in, into the environment, whether it's a human environment, a non-human environment. Uh, there has to be, uh, I suppose, something relational well, is that the balance then between it has to be very specific and very individual, but it also has to be something universal about it? Indeed. And, and how you do that without, because obviously if you, if something's as is such a phrase is too universal, it ends up being too abstract. And well, quite. And, and, and to, to aim simply at, you know, I think I'll write a poem that, with universal resonance, that it's not only a bit presumptuous, pretentious, but mm. it, it can lead one, as you say, into abstraction or the kind of thing that's too remote from the observing eye and the listening ear. And, and as I've implied before, I, I'm trying to write with a, an inward ear and an inward eye uh, about things that are not simply inward. Mm, absolutely. Well, look, I think now is a very good time to have a poem from you. Uh, I'm happy uh, to, to read one. Uh, perhaps I could start with the very first poem Fantastic. in the book. That although makes sense. I, I need to say just a couple of things about it because it's, it's, it's longer than some of the poems mm -hmm. and it also may seem at first to be uh, a, a rather elusive and it does indeed allude to a couple of things which are mentioned in a note. So I'll read the note to the poem first. Beautiful. Um, the opening lines, says the note, refer to Arlington National Cemetery in the USA. I lived there for a while, not in the cemetery, but in the US. <laughs> um, and the graves depicted later in the poem are those of New Zealand soldiers within a war cemetery in um, a place called Burai in New Caledonia. Okay. Uh, they're located near to a place called Turtle Bay, Bay mm. Tortu where I once saw a large turtle killed by local Kanak people for their food. Wow. So okay. uh, that note may help, uh, as I read the poem, to see how I'm trying to draw on a number of things that are distant, in a sense, from me, but bring them together in what I hope 
is a statement about the importance of not being uh, confined in one's perception of relationships to tribal identities or quasi-tribal identities, mm. whether they take the form of, of ethnic groups or uh, gender groups or anything else, I think we've got to go beyond the plural, or at least that's what the poem, I hope, implies. Mm. The poem, the poem's title is Wherever the Body Is, and that's a phrase, a rather enigmatic phrase from a biblical source. Wherever the body is. As rain falls hard on the military funeral, ashes to slush, sods to silt, President Umbrella tells those who are stiff to attention, Americans will never forget lives lost to protect freedom in Iraq, Afghanistan, wherever. They believe that's true in a country where extinction is never seen as final. They believe it because their mighty eagle, even when almost expunged from skies, figures unflappably on every greenback. They believe it because at the local stadium a hundred thousand voices cheer the wolverines whose originals buckled to bullets decades ago. Museums call this kind of history natural, and so it seems to people totally stuffed with memory still gorging out on hope. Witness a sign in a trucker's roadside cafe, God, guns and guts made this country, let's keep it that way. Witness another beside a suburban chapel. Wherever the body is, there will the eagles gather. Easy to mock, but where do you stand to say they? What's your position? Consider a creature of the French Pacific. It's freely amphibious life. How enviable to be in your element not only here but there. Yet nobody yearns for the standard end of longing. Imagine turning turtle, turning under the bluest of enfolding waters, waiting for darkness near this Nickel Island coast, before breaking the surface, tottering ashore, gut-lumbered, labouring on up the gritty slope, driven by a birth clock's tick into sudden lights, a shudder, an overturning, Poles, ropes, shouts, a butchering knife. Change places now, stand over here, and say in the flare of morning, that blade hammered in between the belly plates, is it theirs or yours? And whose are the thick blood bubbles, the ripped out eggs? On a hill near that same bay, a memorial graveyard for misplaced servicemen from the old Pacific War, Pacific they are these days, gravel keeps them that way. The slab lines curve like a great bird's gathering wing, and each name is listed wherever the body is. Snapshot exotica? Not so entirely remote, those grey souvenirs from your own collective presumptions. Here are you, there are corpses. They and we have no place. Wherever the body is, the plural's too large an umbrella. Mm, well, that's quite an extraordinary uh, first poem to open the collection. I love um, the, the description of the turtle. It, it really, it's so empathetic or empathic. It, it, you are right there, you are the turtle, and then you're not the turtle. It's fantastic. Well, I'm glad you think that. That's certainly what I wanted to do. And, and yes, um, it's, it's a poem that uh, tries to give some resonance straight away to the title of the collection, Breaking the Surface, yes, that phrase does appear in the, mm. in the poem, but different senses of breaking the surface recur in other poems. And generally, of course, what I'm trying to do in that poem and in the book generally is to puncture the superficial level of language mm. in a way that poetry at its best can can achieve uh, and try to show something other than appearance and indeed that poem as I hope is, is clear even at just a quick reading that poem is partly about the discrepancy between appearances and and what lies underneath the the the, the, the poor turtle making its way um, driven by the birth clock uh, to lay its eggs um, in a seemingly idyllic uh, sunny um, 
uh, ocean, and then you know the the rather brutal um, and bloody uh, thing that awaits it. And yet the people who kill it are doing so for their food and indeed, and so it's, a cycle it's, of life. it's yes. not something about which simple judgments can be made any more than about the judgments that seem to be made harshly in the early part of the poem when um, uh, mockery is, is, is the initial tone and then there's a standing back from that to say, well, yes, but from what basis are we mocking? Mm. And um, is anyone in a position to say they in a way which distances... Yeah, that's really interesting. From. Mm. I mean, the other thing that I noticed th- through your reading, you, you talked about the importance of rhythm, and I could hear that in the way you read. It was very deliberate that you would um, identify certain areas where there was always these slight pauses and other lines that just ran on in more of a flow. So rhythm is not just about... Regularity. Regularity. It's also about um, uh, varying the tempo, that feeling for pulse. Indeed, uh, indeed. For me, the fundamental thing about poetry is that although it has this really important visual dimension, and I've said this in a different way yes. before, its origins were, of course, in song, in rhythmic chant, mm. in ritual performance. Mm. It goes right back to the early prehistory, and that's partly because it comes from the body's own rhythms, the pulse and the breath. Mm. And uh, I don't want to lose sight of that in any of my poetry, if I can, uh, whether it takes a very regular metrical Mm. form or something, as in that poem, that is more free. And it's quite lovely too, because no matter how um, sophisticated we like to think we are as as modern poets, it does that kind of attitude roots us to a more primal practice that just goes back thousands of years, well, thousands of years indeed, yeah, which is quite lovely, isn't it? It connects you. In that way. That's certainly my feeling. Mm, mm, absolutely. Um, the other thing I noticed too was, uh, talk about the rhythm, but obviously there was a lot of um, sound effects going on there, like all internal rhymes, half rhymes, mm. Um, mm. alliteration, all those, all those stock in trade <laughs> tricks that poets know. But it's, again, to what extent is that a conscious thing or is it almost subconscious now that you just know what, you know, the sound must suit the sense? As well, Shakespeare writes. Yeah, it, it is exactly that. And, and no, I certainly don't set out to, how can I fit some no. alliteration in here or whatever. No, no, it's, it's entirely a matter of rolling the phrases around mm. in my head. Mm. I do a lot of um, uh, drafting and, uh, and rereading of what I've done. And it's all with the aim of trying to elicit things that are latently there, but perhaps I haven't noticed. I, I do the same, I must say, with with my prose too and I've always been pleased when reviewers talk about the things like use phrases like poetic intensity mm. for some mm. of my novels because uh, there too I read everything aloud uh, over and over until I feel that the sentence is right the, the paragraph is right etc so it's not fundamentally different from the way I approach prose but it is of course um, much more concentrated here. Mm. No, absolutely. And I think um, one of the classic examples is Charles Dickens, someone who was also very much a performer and always read his work and adopted the various characters. You know, it's so important exactly. to him, wasn't it? Exactly. And I, I was talking to Alan Five too recently, who's a poet and a, um, a novelist, mm. and he mm. was saying, was there any point really making a distinction between his prose and his poetry? Because he tries to be, as you say, as poetic in his in his. Um, non-poetry, if you want to call it that, to the mm. point where it, it is poetry. Yes, and his, his wonderful um, novel, um, T, uh, does does that quite mm. often. There are mm. passages that uh, you just have to read aloud to whoever will Indeed. listen, Indeed. Um, because he obviously has a, a very good ear. Mm. So um, I'm just wondering, uh, can I ask a much broader question? Mm. The place of poetry in our society today I, it seems to me to um, be closely linked to what we've talked about yes. during this conversation because poetry is the art of renewing language yes. for me. And I mean that because um, we're surrounded by well-worn, in fact, worn-out words, um, whether yes. it's uh, journalism full of mm. clichés, mm and ineptitude in the way things are phrased, or whether it's what we hear on the, on the radio, TV, 
whether it's just in our conversations. And I don't mean it in a disparaging way necessarily, although sometimes i uh, very happy to disparage some of the journalism and so on that I'm <laughs> exposed to. But I mean that um, it's understandable that in ordinary conversation, most of the time we are resorting to phrases that, uh, that just slip easily uh, onto our tongue because they are well known. But they are tired. The language is tired, and when the language gets tired, our perceptions are not as sharp. So poetry uh, in, the, in the modern world, although it is hardly uh, um, uh, the most popular art form, I think still has potential value for anyone who, ha- who will take the time to stop and listen and think, because it, it is potentially a way of breaking the surface of mm. language mm. and finding nuances, perceptions... Uh, unusual ways of uh, directing the reader's attention so that we see things anew. And this is something that has always been true for for poetry. I'm thinking of the fact that both Coleridge and Shelley a couple of centuries ago separately used uh, the same phrase when they were trying to describe what they were aiming at in poetry. They talked, both of them separately, about peeling the film of familiarity Mm. from our eyes Mm. and that that was the art of poetry and I think it does that by uh, using language in a way that even if it takes something that is well worn, uh, a a very familiar metaphor, potentially a cliche, it subverts that in some way, that is making us sit up and take a little more notice of what it is referring to. So that I I think is, is the potential of poetry, and of course, it's not necessarily um, uh, such a, a totally separate form from some other more popular forms. There are uh, all kinds of popular song, mm, uh, hip hop, or whatever. They all draw in one way or another on rhythm or on image, and poetry at its best on the page, and then for the voice as a kind of script for the voice can do that. Um, with the utmost care, and that's what I aim at. No, no, you're absolutely right. I think that that idea of, of rendering the everyday, or people like to say the quotidian, are strange. Hmm. It just it it, it, it it makes you more awake, doesn't it? The exactly. Everyday. And, yes, and I think it was the, the Russian formalists, among others, who talked about uh, literature making the familiar strange and the strange mm, familiar. Absolutely. Spot on. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's interesting too, you're talking about popular song, for example, a lot of people wouldn't even think of that as poetry, but of course a lot of it is. Indeed. And if you go back, say the Elizabethans, for example, a lot of those po- poems were, were songs. That's right. Um, and it's no... Um, Coincidence that uh, the po- sorry the, the the lyrics of someone like Dylan you know is um, are often in printed form aren't they like the collected lyrics quite even a Nobel Prize for literature <laughs> well there you go which some may argue but, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's it's interesting it's, it is interesting hmm. yeah um, so I want to ask you too about your influences because that's something that's always fascinating um, who were some of the poets some of the writers that most influenced your approach to poetry. Um, I mentioned a couple of the Romantic poets yes. from the early 19th yes. century and, and although my poems very seldom would in their form be reminiscent mm. of, uh, um, of, of, of those poets, there are in fact quite close links there in my mind. I, uh, I wrote a, an academic scholarly book about Wordsworth once and Wordsworth uh, is someone who makes various appearances uh, in here and there in these poems, although usually to get banished. There's a poem called On Your Bike, Wordsworth, uh, <laughs> which is partly about cycling, but it's also about how, you know, the, the particular perceptions of landscape mm. that are mm. being uh, recorded in that poem uh, turn out to be, uh, despite what the, the cyclist thinks mm. initially, turn out to be... Um, a kind of reworking of, of the Wordsworthian interfusion of self and, and environment. So there are things like that. Um, uh, Coleridge is uh, perhaps best known for some of the ballads like The, the Ancient Mariner, but he uh, wrote some wonderful conversation poems. Um, 
And I hope that the, the best of my poems in here have a conversational quality about them. Uh, it's something that some people have said about my poetry, and I'm, I'm glad when they say that, because uh, I don't want to be abstruse, I don't want to be too far from everyday speech. I just want that everyday speech to be intensified and to have its surface broken in particular mm. ways, mm. as I've said. So, um, so that's one kind of influence, but, but nearer to the present, uh, I spent time in the US partly because of my involvement with some American poets of the 1970s and 80s, people like Robert Duncan, mm. and more mm. particularly Denise Levitoff, yes. with whom I had quite a close relationship and who was a distinctive influence on my, on my work. Her control of rhythm... Um, her use of a very free form, nevertheless, to do some of the things we were talking about earlier in our conversation, um, to direct the reader's attention in a particular way and highlight certain phrases and, and so forth. All of that uh, I've, I've learnt from her and from others. Um, so, I mean, there could be a very long list, but it mm. includes no, no, some more remote in time and some close to the present. I mean, and, and one always assumes that um, the, the best of poets um, would read widely and perhaps read things that they might not necessarily, you know, identify with, but it's, it's good, good for the craft, isn't it? Indeed, yes. And uh, there are um, quite a few echoes from particular poems, particular poets in this book, and yes. there are some little notes at the back, not that it's trying to be a... Uh, a scholarly book, but mm. but just uh, to disclose some of the sources, um, and they do include some of the people I've mentioned. Mm, okay, look, maybe as a last question, if I may, um, your working habits. I mean, you mentioned that you know, a lot of these poems are collected at various points over the years, but I'm just wondering, um, as as a poet, are you someone who who labours? And again, you have talked about this about how you mm. like to refine drafts and so forth. One remembers Virgil, for example, and it was like one or two lines a day or something like that, and that's it. And the other end of the spectrum, you might have someone like John Kinsella who just manages to just produce poetry, <laughs> you know, and there's yeah. everything in between. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm certainly a, a kind of reiterative a poet who goes back over yes. things. Like revises and, continuously. Re- revises mm. and, and, and just lets things roll around in the mind, even okay. if they're not committed to paper. Yes. Um, so I often make little jottings, and they might be just a phrase, yes. a perception, yes. uh, a thought, an image. And then eventually that develops. Uh, I go back to it and think, oh, I don't I could put that there and then I could mm, mm, start with mm. something else. So um, that's the way I generally work. Uh, I, uh, you know, but I, I have sometimes written quite quickly some of the poems here, including the, 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 the last one I wrote, although it's not the last one in the book, uh, just came, as it were, Natural. straight out. Yes. But mostly I'm very suspicious, I have to say, uh, how, no matter how... Um, and no matter how um, famous the particular example might be, people who write or give the appearance of writing just spontaneously, sometimes I wish they wouldn't. I wish they'd go back because some people write too much, too easily, uh, whoever they are. I don't, no, no, I, don't I completely agree with you. And, no, I, understand. Uh, I, I think if you want your poetry to be memorable, uh, then you need to do everything you can to maximise that, that effect. Uh, it wasn't as if Virgil uh, or Homer uh, or Wordsworth even simply dashed things off. Mm. There might have been a spontaneity about something. Well, exactly. It's often actually quite good to give the impression that it was dashed off, but exactly. it's a contrivance, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. So, um, I mean, Wordsworth talked about that uh, in one of his mm. famous utterances. Yes, spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, yes, but recollected in tranquility. Yes, and, indeed. And the implication is indeed. worked over very mm, often. Mm, absolutely right. So, Ian, where can one obtain the Breaking the Service and, and who, indeed, is it published by? It's published by Gin and Dara Press, an okay. uh, Adelaide-based publisher specialising mm-hmm. in poetry. Um, and I think they've done a good job in producing this. And you can, simply the simplest way for anyone who wants to get hold of a copy um, is to go to the website for Ginandera Press, that's G-I-N-N, etc., Ginandera, uh, and uh, you can buy it online, yes. and that's probably the simplest way, okay. because 
not all bookshops are going to stock no, poetry. No, exactly. Uh, I mean, there are copies around in bookshops, such as the Lane Bookshop, but mm. um, but mostly I think it's it's easiest just to go online and see where it's available. And of course, it can be got through Amazon and the usual uh, online selling sources. As and well. then, what's the average price? Uh, the recommended retail price is usually, uh, I think, from the published twenty seven fifty. Um, and so, yes, that would normally be what you'd have to mm. pay for it. Bargain at half the price, as Indeed. they say. <laughs> well, Ian Reid, thank you so much for joining us on Pod Street. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Very welcome, Will. Thank you.